Samir, you yeah, can we are live. go live. Yeah. We are live now. Mic check. Yeah, once again, good evening to the participants who have joined and a very good morning to Tom, who is sitting in Seattle, USA, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I can see about 23 people have joined. We'll wait for a couple of minutes uh, before we start our program. Yeah, once so again, good evening. can join in. I can see there are a lot many people in the waiting room. So just give them a few minutes and then we'll start our program. There's that nice background, Samir. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice background. Oh man. Oh, we got varying ones. Oh, that's gorgeous. Interesting to see people hitting our website from India, which normally doesn't happen very often. Somebody in Hyderabad. Yeah. I can't see the details. I think people get worried that I can see what they're doing or, you know, what their home address is. Somebody from Hyderabad and, of course, somebody from Mumbai. Okay. <laughs> well, the Hyderabad person's been on for 30 minutes, so they're really digging in. Good for them. Okay, so once again, welcome to everyone in today's program and uh, I will uh, start the today's program. Uh, Khagol Mandal welcomes you all for talk on spectroscopy. The today's lecture is you can almost touch the stars by Tom Field, who is a president field tested systems. Uh, and he's also a contributing editor to Sky and Telescope uh, magazine. Uh, I'll, the, I'll quickly tell you the outline of today's talk, uh, today's program. Uh, we'll start off with introduction to the organizing uh, agency, Khagol Mandal. Then I'll introduce you to the you know, speaker. And then we'll hand over the online platform to Tom Field. And by 8.20, almost, you can take a few minutes here and there, Tom, depending on how the talk goes on. Uh, by 8.20, 8.30, we'll take the question and answers. Uh, my request to all the participants is that please type in your queries in the chat box and send it to me, who is, uh, I'm Sujata, your host today. So please type in your queries in the chat box and uh, send it to me. I'll read out those questions to Tom during the question and answer session, and then he'll answer. Now, a quick introduction to Khagol Mandal. Uh, Khagol Mandal started off in July, on 6 July 1985. So 35 years ago, Khagol Mandal started off, uh, and the inception of Khagol Mandal was uh, head, uh, what you say, um, was there because of in 1986, Halley's Comet was going to come near the Earth. So that was the event that uh, caused inception of Khagol Mandal. And Khagol Mandal was started by a group of uh, enthusiastic people who loved astronomy. They were not necessarily from the science background. So Khagol Mandal is active since uh, 1985 for 35 years. 
and Kagol Mandal conducts various programs like we invite uh, expert people and they give talk like how Tom is going to do today. We also conduct sky shows in uh, rural areas. We conduct several courses on astronomy on different subjects in astronomy like astrophotography and um, uh, introductory astro uh, astronomy. Uh, we also conduct student special programs for the students who are in school, students who are in colleges, so basically different educational backgrounds. And our mainstream program is the overnight sky show, which we conduct every month near New Moon Day uh, in, of course, non-monsoon season when the skies are uh, clear. Kagol Mandir also uh, has publications. We have published a book called Tarangan in Marathi as well as in English, which is written by our own uh, uh, former president, uh, Pradeep Nayak. And it's a fantastic book that gives you, uh, that introduces you to the night sky, tells you how to identify the constellations and all that. So it's a great book. We also have a free e-magazine called as Khagol Vishwa, which is published in Marathi, which is the uh, uh, language of Maharashtra. And we also uh, have these uh, sky maps, color sky maps, which are in A3 size, laminated sky maps. So you can take them to the field and identify the sky. Uh, we also meet regularly every Wednesday at Sadhana Vidyalay near Sion in uh, Science Station in Mumbai from 6.30 to 8.30 PM. So once the lockdown is over, people can join us over there. Uh, we also have a unit at Nasik, and they meet the enthusiastic group meets every Sunday at Vidya Prabodhini School again from 6:30 to 8:30 p.m. And we also have our online presence at kagolmandal.com, then on Facebook, and you can send your emails to manager at kagolmandal.com in case you want to uh, contact us. Uh, we you can also contact us for the uh, uh, conducting different programs for schools, for uh, your society, or for your group. Um, and you can contact Milin Kale, you can contact Abhay Deshpande or Sujata Babar. Uh, now, this is about Khagol Mandal in brief. Now, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Tom Field, to you. Uh, he has been a contributing editor to the famous magazine called Sky and Telescope for past seven years. He is also the author of the software called R-Spec software, which has received SNT Hot Product Award in 2011. And you can get more details of this software and about Tom Field's work on his website, www.rspec-astronomy.com. Uh, Tom Field has been a very popular speaker who has given hundreds of talks via webinars at many conferences, uh, including NEF, PATS, the Winter Star Party, Advanced Imaging Conferences, SCAE, and many others. Uh, and uh, to uh, say that he has been a great Indophile. He loves India. He has been to India. He has visited Kochi. He has visited Coimbatore. He has been to Elephanta Caves in Mumbai. He <laughs> likes to be there in India and hope that in future, after this lockdown situation, someday we'll have Tom here physically uh, sitting amongst us. Now, having said this, let me hand over the um, online platform to Tom and he can begin his Tom uh, talk. Welcome, Tom. Take us to a different, amazing field. <laughs> Very well done. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sujata. And thank you for the uh, the invitation here for uh, Abai, who set us up uh, and made all the arrangements for scheduling, and Samir, who is handling the technical aspects of streaming. Um, I am honestly very honored to be here tonight. Uh, as Sujata said, I have been to India many times. I've lived in India and, uh, and have an enormous respect for India, for its potential, for its people, for its heritage uh, and history. So thank you so much for that. 
Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Give me just a moment while I do that. And uh, we'll have that set up and ready to go. Um, if if uh, Sujata, if you can't see the prism on your screen, let me know. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. We can see. Okay. It. Great. Crystal clear. Yeah. Good. Great. And when, before you turn your mic off again, can you tell me about this uh, logo, its significance? I love it. Yeah. That is the logo of Kabul Mandal. And yeah. uh, that is a person observing the sky through the telescope. Oh, I love it. That's really good. I'm yeah, we had set up on the competition of making logo for Kabul Mandal in 1985-86. And one of our volunteers, Santosh, um, he designed this logo for us and uh -huh. gave it to us. It's a, it's a great logo. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Very nice. Thanks, Abhay. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to talk for a while, and then we'll have questions. And uh, I hope that uh, this will be a talk that uh, keeps you interested and uh, reminds you of uh, the many wonderful things that we all can learn uh, for, for a lifetime of excitement with astronomy. So how is it that we've managed to discover so much about the universe when we've barely set foot outside our own front door? Now, images can show the universe in two dimensions, and some of you may recognize this as the Hubble Deep Field. You know, this is a piece of the sky that's the size of a tennis ball held at arm's length. It's amazing how much is in such a small slice of the sky if you look deep enough. We can get fleeting glimpses of a third dimension during an eclipse when things pass in front of each other. And if we wait a while, we can see the fourth dimension of time. And you can probably see in the upper corner on the right, those stars going on and off. These are our Lyrae standard candles. If we spread the colors out, we can see an as if fifth dimension. Just in itself, this is beautiful qualitatively. I love how the colors transition from one color to the next very gradually, very gracefully. And these reveal a barcode about our star or any object that we study and helps us learn about the object that we're studying. There's many different things that we'll talk about this evening that a barcode allows. We can uh, see, of course, what the star is made of and uh, uh, what its radial velocity is coming towards us, moving away from us. Uh, if it's spinning, and I'll show you an example of this. I think I've got some props here to show you. If it's spinning, what kind of uh, rate of rotation it has. Uh, also, its temperature and where it would be uh, on the HR curve uh, on its uh, life cycle and its distance. Now I'm going to go, this will be the slide that has the most words on it. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, these, I give many talks to amateur uh, astronomy clubs uh, and many of them are imagers and I want them to understand what my vision is and what I want to communicate with them. But we'll do this very quickly. And by the way, my apologies for my accent. I know that, that it's different than an Indian accent. So you might want to start ca capture star specter if you remember the thrill of that first image you took. Now, again, I'm talking to people here generally who have done some imaging. And you know, the first image that people capture is usually the moon and it's very overexposed and blurry, but it's gorgeous to their eyes. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And that thrill of capturing data is something that I discovered when I started spectroscopy. And by the way, my history is that 30 years ago, when Shoemaker Levy 9 was about to uh, hit the planet, I wanted to learn astronomy. I was excited. And uh, when I got involved, I went out one night uh, and wanted to capture spectra. And I'll be talking a little bit technically about how that happened. Uh, and over the last uh, 10 years now, uh, through my passion and interest in this field, I. Uh, surprisingly to me, and I mean this honestly, there's no false humility, found myself uh, in a position to uh, evangelize. It's a funny word for a scientist to use, isn't it? To be an evangelist? To evangelize spectroscopy. 
And <clears throat> it's been a lot of fun for me to be able to give that gift of knowledge. With spectroscopy, amateurs can uh, do new science. They can contribute to professional amateur pro-am collaborations. Uh, it's very inexpensive to, uh, to do to get started. Uh, nobody likes to spend money. And the, one of the very exciting things for me is when you own the data, when you have it in your hands, you have a very different relationship to it. It's no longer something abstract. It's something you're interested in and you're going to read about and remember about. And it, it, that's been a real, uh, really exciting aspect for me. And I know there in Mumbai, the skies are uh, often very bright and uh, there's um, a lot of light pollution as well as uh, air pollution. And uh, dark sky sites can be difficult to get to, but uh, spectroscopy is uh, very immune to light pollution, much more so than Im standard imaging. <laughs> I don't have a PhD in astrophysics. I am a knuckle dragging programmer. And uh, I, you don't have to have a PhD to learn a lot about the stars from spectroscopy. Nor do you need to have a lot of technical skills. Now I know most of you aren't using telescopes today. So we'll move quickly through this list uh, and get on to the interesting aspects of the talk. So we're going to talk a little bit of history here and a little bit of science to get everybody to the same level. Forgive me, many of these topics uh, you probably are familiar with and uh, can explain better than me. Better than I. All right, so Newton split light using a, a prism into its component colors. You can also bounce light off of a finely lined surface like a DVD and get a rainbow or even pass that light through finely lined glass. And we'll look at that <clears throat> shortly. In 1814, Fraunhofer discovered the spectrometer. And by the way, I wrote it down here so I would get the name right. Uh, this, uh, I was doing some reading on Indian astronomy and this, uh, this book uh, or this gentleman, Surya Siddhanta, Surya Siddhanta, 7,000 years ago, if, uh, if he has been accurately dated uh, by historians, by modern historians, uh, did a lot of wonderful astronomy. India's tradition in astronomy, uh, as well as many other areas, has been uh, really remarkable in its age and its depth. And it's one of the things I have a great respect for. So forgive me if most of these examples will be Westerners. It's very European centric. Uh, and I will leave it to all of you. Somebody in this audience perhaps uh, will give a talk on the history of astronomy in India if that talk hasn't been given before. So now we come to this gentleman Bunsen who many of us are familiar with. Bunsen invented the Bunsen burner to burn a sample. That's a terrible color here. To burn a sample put the light through a prism and look at the results. <laughs> he was a pyromaniac. He burnt everything and he cataloged everything, which was exciting because it meant that we had that information to build on, to grow on. Now, Kirchhoff was a colleague and a friend of Bunsen's. And he gave us some, uh, as if rules to help us understand and uh, the kinds of things we were seeing in spectra. Before we leave this screen, I wanted to point out that uh, Bunsen did something really amazing. He refused to patent the Bunsen burner. And he said, I, I wish, this is the first time I've mentioned this, uh, I wish I had his words quoted. I have to get them. They're very flowery uh, in a good way. But he says, I want the Bunsen burner to be used by scientists with no charge to do research that will better humanity. And uh, today, of course, there would be 10 patents on each Bunsen burner. So, but to look at these Kirchhoff laws, we won't get into a lot of detail, but I wanted to show you this, that a spectrum can be a rainbow with gaps called absorption spectra, or it can be black 
with lines called emission spectra. And we will see examples of both tonight. Notice that the lines are the same, in the same position, regardless of whether they're emission or absorption lines. Now, we won't talk about why there are differences. It has something to do with the gas temperatures and things like that. We need not get into that science tonight. But here are these chemical fingerprints. Again, forgive me for reviewing what many of you may be familiar with. And we can see very clearly that this hydrogen line does not exist in helium. These really are fingerprints. And hydrogen is so often used that we have named its lines and given them Greek names, Greek letters. We will see these a lot tonight. They are like a beacon to help us orient like a lighthouse. Here is a periodic table of spectra, which I created several years ago. I'm happy to say that Neil deGrasse Tyson has one hanging in his office, he told me. I stood out in the rain for two or three hours with my wife outside the theater here in Seattle when he was speaking to uh, show him this poster. He loved it and, this, and then he said, can I have one? And my wife in her wisdom had brought a poster in a tube ready for him. It had my business card in it. And, uh, and a year later when I did the same thing, he, uh, he told me he had hung it in his office. But I have to confess, I don't think I'm going to stand out on the street to see him again because it ended up feeling like, I, like he was a rock star and I was a fan, which is true. <laughs> he is a star and I am a fan, but it felt more like, and this is a great example for India, it felt like I was a subject in a kingdom and the Raja is coming out of the palace and I'm standing impoverished on the street with my hands out asking for Neil deGrasse Tyson to give me some coins. That's how it felt. It was, it was distasteful. But, but he has 13 million Twitter followers. Imagine if he tweeted out my poster. Instead of our selling posters, my wife and I sit in front of the television, rolling up posters and stuffing them in tubes. We do that sometimes. If he was to tweet out my poster to 13 million followers, we would have to hire some, some high school student and, and install him or her in a garage somewhere in some room where they could assemble posters. Anyway, just some, some fun stories. So notice that hydrogen has those hydrogen bomber lines that I mentioned. But for example, helium does not, very different lines. Here, for example, is the lithium that is in the battery in your cell phone. Again, very different lines. So we can use gas tubes in education. These days, we don't have to burn. <laughs> we don't have to burn uh, uh, elements. Well, we can now use gas tubes. And I actually have one sitting here. Here's a gas tube. We'll turn that light off. And that's actually a hydrogen gas tube that's burning in there. And uh, we'll use that as an as a example in another few minutes. Um, we also developed this uh, handheld spectrometer for teachers uh, in high school and universities to use uh, to demonstrate gas tube spectra. So in 1835, and we are jumping around, I apologize, August Comte said, we will never be able to know what the stars are made of. They're too far away. And yet several decades later, we were studying the stars and learning about their composition. These people included Italians and uh, British uh, and other nationalities. Comte was right. In his time, we had no idea that such a powerful science was going to grow so quickly. So far, every example I have shown has been an old white man, of which I am one. 
I wanted to show some examples of other great contributors to the field. First of all, Annie Jump Cannon and her team of women who were called computers. They were prohibited a hundred years ago or so from accessing the telescopes because of their gender. It's very unfair. They took the job of studying the glass plates upon which spectra were captured. And through their attention to detail, their ingenuity, their creativity, and their genius and hard work, they came up with a star classification system that has allowed us to study the stars for the last century and understand them. Priyamvada Nataraja, and I have her, her uh, CV here. She's at Yale and uh, she studies dark matter and dark energy and gravitational lensing. And this is not a special example I chose because I'm speaking to India. This is a new slide to me, which is why I haven't memorized her, bio, her uh, biography yet. But uh, this is a, a slide that I show to every club I speak to. Nancy Grace Roman was a PhD astronomer in about 1950 and the first astronomer for NASA. Her vision was the Hubble Space Telescope. She made it happen. What a wonderful achievement. Elisa Quintana studies exoplanets. She discovered an exoplanet around a red star that is in just the right position, the Goldilocks position, so it has liquid, it could have liquid water, not frozen, not too hot. So there could potentially be a life there. And Jedediah Isler is, um, again, I need to refer to her CV. Oh, I love this hyperactive, supermassive black holes. And she's at Dartmouth. So there are many great contributors to the field who have not been old white men. And many, many more. It was very difficult uh, last week when I started looking for uh, women of color uh, to, to stop because there were so many fascinating astronomers about which we about whom we have not heard. So very quick science here. I'm going a little slowly so that my English is a little easier for you. But this is a little of the science you are all familiar with, I, I suppose. The Bohr model of the atom has electrons in orbits. And when they jump between these orbits, they uh, release energy. Like when you drop a tennis ball and it comes to rest, it has less potential energy than it had when it was higher. This is not gravitational, but same principle. And that released energy can be seen and is different depending on which jump. Once again, we can see down here the uh, hydrogen atom. Uh, we can see hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, and our friend hydrogen gamma. I love this photograph of Einstein with Niels Bohr. Look at his posture. He's like really, really relaxed. Here are some professional spectrographs. This one on the right is in southern France and discovered the first exoplanet spectroscopically. And this spectrograph on the Hubble is being repaired by an astronaut from the space shuttle. Now, my son, he says that that is not an astronomical equipment. He says that that is a refrigerator. It's filled with beer. And at night, they, they are big party animals when the space shuttle was flying. And of course, in 24 hours, they have a lot of nights. I don't think he's right, but we'll leave that be for now. Here is a more complicated device of my friend Dale Mace. And what I like here is this gas tube with the two pins on the end there, right there. And I imagine him with alligator clips and high voltage <laughs> trying to attach there. And you know, if, if he draws a spark, his night vision will go. 
and he'll have to you know wait until it comes back. But what I wanted to show you tonight is what I have specialized in. This is called a star analyzer grading. And I've got an example here. It has 100 lines per millimeter. It costs about 200 US dollars. And it's in an inch and a quarter uh, filter cell. Now, it is a diffraction grading. Uh, I'm going to turn on that uh, hydrogen gas tube again. And we'll see if we can get, oh, there's the spectrum there. You can see it <clears throat> on my video image. Many different spectra lined up. Where'd it go? There it is lined up on one another. Oh, that's even better there. You can see various spectra there. So this is just like a prism in the way that it splits the light. The simplest way to use a, a grating like this is on a DSLR. There it is on the lens cap threads. And notice there's no tracking. Very simple setup. And look down here, we got some hydrogen alpha, beta, and gamma absorption lines with just a DSLR. Now, this is not as easy as it might look from the equipment I'm showing you because it's not tracking. So that they, again, you have a drift spectra, you have to uh, you know, get things aligned right and it's small aperture. So you end up having to stack or add images, but it's possible people do it. Here are other examples of what people do with a star analyzer. They, might mount it on a, you know, a professional or amateur cooled fits camera, or they could just screw it on like this here onto the nose piece of a, a video camera, color, mono, doesn't matter. Oh, here is what I showed you a minute ago. Notice that uh, there's a little adapter here that adapts the threads on the lens cap threads <laughs> to the inch and a quarter for the, uh, for the grading. And then down here, it can be mounted in a filter cell. There are more expensive devices that have slits. I'll show you a few examples of those, but they're more difficult to use because they have a maybe a 20 micron slit. And uh, nobody generally starts with those. Although some people do both. They have an expensive device here and they have a DSLR here, piggyback. Okay, finally, we're done, we're done with the history theory and equipment. <clears throat> Thank you all for your patience. Uh, you have some background of the science and how we got here today. So if you have a star and you pass its light through a grating, you get this spectrum down here. Let's look at our first example. This is a series of spectra of different stars. It was captured by this guy down here, Torsten Hansen, with a 20 centimeter Newtonian and a video camera. Each of these is a different spectrum, and these stars from top to bottom are in temperature order. O, B, a fine G, K, M, right? And these are the cool stars down here. Notice the differences. This is a very exciting image because we can see very clearly that different temperature stars have different spectra. Notice this one right here that's coming down here, this is our hydrogen beta line, our, our good friend. And notice that this one is broader and darker than the others because this type A star is a good temperature. These stars are too hot. So some of the electrons uh, get ionized and, and get, get ejected more or less from the, uh, from the atom. And these are too cool. Some of the electrons don't get pumped up to that level to allow that transition to occur, which creates that line. But look at these cool stars on the bottom. They have no bomber lines, but they have these wide bands. These stars are relatively cool enough that we can see them uh, and we can see molecules in their gas shell that have not been burnt up and broken apart by intense heat on the other stars. Now, this is a good point. You know, my wife always says, dress for success. And I think for this slide, this is probably the right place to, for me to get into my, uh, my proper dress. I think, I think this is the hydrogen bomber line right here. Uh, the beta is there and uh, let's see the alpha and so forth. It's all nice to have some fun. 
So, you know, if we have this spectrum, and can you see that crosshairs I just drew there? Right where those crosshairs meet is a little bit of dimming. I don't know if you can see that there. I know it's there so I can see it. It may be a creative imagination, averted imagination. So, but you know, I couldn't write a science paper where I said, we used the, um, the spectrograph on the Hubble and we saw a tiny bit of dimming in the robin egg blue. <laughs> That's not science, right? So we need to quantify this data. And we do that with a simple intensity graph. This star is bright and it's narrow. So this is high and narrow. It's an intensity graph. This goes from narrow to thick, right? And bright to narrow. So that's what this does. And the exciting thing is that dip that's in the crosshair shows up very clearly. And now we can do science. Now we can study the width of that dip, the full width half maximum, its location or wavelength, how it compares to other stars, other dips. This is science. How do we get that spectra? Now, actually, I wanted to tell you just a little bit more about my story. And that is, I went out in 2009 and I took this grating and I put it on my eight inch SCT telescope in my backyard here in Seattle. And at midnight, I came in. My blue jean knees had grass stains because I was looking at Vega that was right overhead. So I had to get down on my knees to aim the telescope. And the next morning, I tried to process my spectrum. And the free software that was out there was not adequate. It was crashing. It was poorly designed. The half of it was in French. I quit. I gave up. And I gave up because I told my wife, this is supposed to be fun. This is my hobby. And I took the grading and I put it in its box and I put it in a drawer. Honestly, I tell you. I wanted to do this though. And over the next week, I kept thinking about it. And one day at lunch, I thought, I'll just write a program that creates this graph. That can't be that hard. I, that's what I do for a profession. I'll do it Saturday. So I did it Saturday and had my graph Sunday morning. And now 10 years later, and maybe an additional five or 10,000 hours later, I'm almost done writing this software. I showed it to friends and they liked it. And uh, this was not supposed to become a business. And uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. But what I want to show you, I'm going to clear that screen. I want to show you the software for a moment because I want you to see how easy this can be. So. This is an image from a telescope, from a DSLR, from a video camera. There's our star, there's our spectrum, there's a couple gaps. This could be a video. Now, if I drag this sampling box around my data, over on the right, we can see that intensity graph. This is Vega. This is the first spectrum I captured my first night out. And I am not good at this stuff. I, that I was able to do it means it's easy. So this peak is that star. Look at all the dips that we can't see all of them here visually, but we can see them quantitatively. That's uh, water in the atmosphere. And these other dips, and then now the problem becomes big. How do I know what dips are which? Remember, Bunsen burnt and created a catalog of every element he could find. And this software has a catalog like that in it. Here's the catalog. Let's come down here to hydrogen bomber. I think you can read that there. Hydrogen bomber. And ask the software to put a template over the data showing us where the bomber lines would be. And if I had set up my demonstration right, <laughs> we would have seen that immediately. Look at that. There's a line, the hydrogen beta line from the template goes right through our data. Same thing here with the hydrogen gamma and the hydrogen delta and hydrogen alpha. Wow, this is science. We have very strong evidence that this star Vega is composed of hydrogen and is hot enough to create these lines. 
on a backyard telescope or with just a plain DSLR, we've done this. So now when I do star parties, I generally make it nice and colorful, right? So this is the rainbow that came from the star because of the grating, which acts like a telescope. Oh, excuse me, it acts like a prism. So now this is actually a video I made that first night and I'm gonna play you that video. It's playing at two frames per second. The seeing, the atmospheric thermal disturbance is changing. And so this is jumping around. We can even have the software stack or average these images. And when we do that, we average out the noise and these features become very clear. I love watching that. Let's watch this hydrogen alpha. I'm gonna turn stacking off. Look at it jumping around. You can barely see there's a feature there, right? It comes and goes, that dip. And our human minds, our human eyes and brain aren't really good at integrating it uh, at this long wavelength or low, uh, at this high at this higher frequency. Let's see, what would it be? Lower frequency. When I turn stacking on, look how quickly, that's the last time I used that frequency analogy before I really think it through. Look how quickly with stacking, adding averaging images that that feature becomes clear. Okay, so I'm gonna leave the screen and we probably won't come back, but I want you, if you would, to in your mind's eye, just remember this. There won't be a quiz, but I'm gonna come back to this Vega view with the bomber lines when we talk about quasars in a little bit. Okay, let me get that uh, slide set up again. We'll come back to where we were and we'll keep moving. And now we're going to move pretty fast. I know some of you may be a little impatient, but we're gonna move very quickly here. So here's a wide field view with a DSLR. This star spectrum has some emission lines, whereas this star spectrum has some absorption lines. Now, Several years ago, actually 10 years ago, Janet Simpson in the UK sent me this image of a wolf A star she'd captured with a DSLR and one of those mechanical tracking devices. I have a confession. I couldn't remember what a wolf A star was. I, you know, I'd read about it. I've read about wolf A stars over the years many times, but they, it goes in one ear and out the other. Well, Wikipedia is our friend. These are late stage stars. The outer shell has been dissipated. We're now able to see towards the core and we're actually seeing carbon the, as if soot from the combustion process of that star. And we're seeing that with just a DSLR. Now these are very wide here for those of you who are very scientific because of the intense stellar winds on these stars. So, but if we look at our beloved M57, and I'm told many of you are familiar with the, um, with the Messier objects, it would look like this because it's an extended object, but it really only has two emission lines, this ionized oxygen and, and uh, hydrogen alpha. So without a slit, extended objects are often, with this one exception, are often not interesting. The spectrum is all smeared. Let's look at another beloved object, M42. This time with a slit spectrometer. Same features, but notice how narrow these features are. Now, when I first got into astronomy, I went to a star party, I knew nothing. And they had all the, to my eye, they had all these things. You probably have these circuses in India where they shoot people out of cannons, these big cannons. <laughs> That's what I saw on this observing field. They were daubs, of course, but I didn't know. When I got to the telescope, very excited to see M42 because the amateurs were saying what, what a beautiful object it was. I was really, really disappointed. It was a smudge. It was like a cloud. I, was, I really was disappointed. But today I continue to come back to look at M42. Why? Why do people who are disappointed like maybe you were, come back and look at an object like this. And I would say it's because we understand more about what we're seeing. And when we bring that additional knowledge to the eyepiece, our enjoyment gets that much deeper. Now also our, our averted vision has gotten better. This is my farcical averted vision device. I'm looking at you now, but look at this. Now I've got some averted vision, right? You, I can still look at you, but it doesn't look like I'm looking at you. So, all right. Now, for those of you who are going, he's a clown and he hasn't taught us anything of interest now. I knew all this. Fasten your seatbelts. 
So here is Uranus and Neptune spectrum done with an eight inch Newtonian and a video camera also. Notice the wide spectra, the wide uh, absorption bands, excuse me, and they show up graphically here. This is the methane gas on these planets. Now, Sue Jata, with your background in astrobiology, this is the kind of thing people in your discipline love to see. And 30 years ago, couldn't believe it would ever be possible on such small equipment. Yes, that's really great, yes. Thank you, isn't that amazing? Yeah. And yes. so uh, this is now, now, and this is how, when we discover ET, and I hope Sujata has given many talks on this or will to your group, it will be with spectra. We will detect gases that we believe are uh, related to, oh, see, Sujata, I'm making a big mess of this, aren't I? We will detect gases that are probably produced by life and are short-lived, and so uh, probably indicate life is currently present. But I'll leave the, that topic to somebody who knows more about it than I do, which could be uh, Sujata, of course, or most anybody knows more than I know. Here's our beloved Albirio. And we can see again very briefly that uh, the, uh, this star, this star which is with the, which the B star has more energy down here in the hot end of the spectrum and the, the other star has more energy in the yellow red. Okay, so in 1881, Henry Draper observed a comet spectrum. Hey, if Hank can do it, so can we. Here's comet Ison some years ago, captured with an 80 millimeter refractor and a Canon DSLR. Now this is an extended object, so you should be thinking, wait a second, Tom, you said no extended objects unless you had a slit. Well, this is, is an extended object, but it has a compact core. Now this is not also, I did not cherry pick this slide because I'm talking to India. This was captured by my good friend, uh, Vikrant Agnihotri. He lives in uh, Rajasthan. He's a nuclear power plant engineer and uh, is now an expert uh, spectroscoper. Uh, and as I said, good friend. We collaborate on projects. Uh, we text message every day or once a week. Uh, he tells me what's going on in his life and. Uh, it's wonderful to have a friend like him to collaborate with. Oh, by the way, those are the uh, swan bands uh, on this little, from this little string of gems. Now, anybody who uses a C-clamp on their telescope, that, that's my kind of guy or gal. There's the star analyzer on a video camera. Now, Robin Leadbeater aimed that where there were going to be some meteoroid, uh, uh, meteors. And this is one frame here. And over that period of time, we can see uh, the travel that occurred. And at this particular time, there was an outburst. Then this bolide, again, he was able to capture and classify some of those absorption lines. This is a, this is a subset of normal spectroscopy by amateurs. It's harder but they enjoy it, so I'm happy for them to be doing it. It's harder because the objects are moving and they're not always there. I'm not going to talk a lot about the flash spectrum because there's been so much talk about that over the last several years. We discovered helium on the sun first. And remarkable. And there's the line that did it. So if uh, you, even with the DSR, want to study novae, we can see here I box it in that some novas, some novae have features that others don't, that iron on the left. Again, Doppler shift, uh, you're uh, all familiar with. Just briefly, of course, it's the pitch change or the wavelength change of light or sound as it comes towards you, differing as from when it's going away. Like when a train comes through the station and its, uh, it's whistle goes, coming towards, coming towards, going away, going away. Same thing happens with light. So if we were expecting spectra here and we found it here, we would know because it was shifted to the red that that object was moving or as if moving away from us. And if it's shifted to the blue, we know it's coming towards us. Let's look at a great example, a supernova. Very briefly, a supernova, two stars, you all know this two stars orbiting one another. And again, over time, because of the, the differences in size and gas and gravity, 
we end up uh, with the smaller star accumulating. I don't like this word spilling. It's not like this red star is spilling. That's like watering a plant. Did you spill water? Did you knock your glass of water over at the dinner table? No, it's, it's gravity both ways, but I don't, I don't think the red star is doing anything. Gravity's doing the work here. Anyway, regardless of my longitudinal hair splitting, when you pour gas on something hot, it explodes. So here is a type 1A supernova in M101, and there's what a similar supernova looks like. I love this image, and you've all seen this. Again, you can see the shell of that supernova expanding around it. Now, there's the spectrum captured by David Strange on a nine inch telescope in less than 15 minutes of different images that he stacked. And there's the spectrum that he captured. And there is a beautiful deep dip in the spectrum. You know, it said, and it's true, we are standing on the shoulders of giants with our knowledge. And those giants have determined that a very deep dip there tells us something about the type of supernova, that it's these two stars sharing gas. I love this image. These are the different types of supernovae. This, by the way, is available on the web, um, and I can send you a link to it uh, if you contact me on our site, if you care to. Uh, here's a type 1A supernova, and look, this green section there is ionized silicon. But look at these core collapse supernovae, different mechanism. This 1C has a little silicon, but these have none. This is how professionals classify supernovae. And what David did was he measured that wavelength on the x-axis at 6150 angstroms. There it is, 6150. And after he'd done that measurement, he looked up what, if Bunsen had burnt silicon beet sand, what he would have found the wavelength to be. 6355. Now, I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula. I went to Wikipedia. There's the formula. I plugged the numbers in, and we were able to calculate the shift, the blue shift, as that supernova shell came towards us. Wow. Pretty amazing, huh? <laughs> I, was, I was laughing because I was going to try and make a joke, but it's not funny enough. So with that warning, I was going to say what's really amazing is that this geocentric American is actually showing kilometers per second and not only miles per hour. You know, in, 19, in the 1950s, a commission in this country voted on whether to stick with these archaic imperial units or to go to metric. And by one vote of this group of six or seven, I think, they voted against it. And we have suffered ever since, suffered in understanding I mean, just it's awful. I mean, I suppose you want to calculate how much water is in a bathtub. It's easy in metric. <laughs> what a strange calculation. But there's times that you need those kinds of numbers, right? So in 2011, Adam Rees won the Nobel Prize for his work with his team done before the turn of the century on the accelerating cosmological expansion. He used type 1A supernovae as his standard candles. And here, as amateurs, we're able to do the same thing. So even though you don't have a telescope, you now know, if you didn't before, a little more about how supernovas, I'm going back to show you this. I, I think this is so wonderful, this, this image, because of how clearly it establishes the differences of uh, the spectra of different supernovae. Okay, now let's go past all that stuff and get back. What about a black hole? The center of a galaxy. Now, you know, I want to I want to again confess something else. I'm not an astrophysicist. I am not a scientist. And I have a very broad knowledge, but I'm assuring you it is not very deep because I'm starting to get a knot in my stomach because I know the Q&A portion of this meeting is coming up very soon. <laughs> and I also know how brilliant many of you are and you will be asking me questions that I probably will not be able to answer. So I want to get that out in the open right now that 
again, I, it's not that I can explain any of these topics in great depth, but uh, my passion and enthusiasm carries me a long way. And, and there's nothing wrong. Well, maybe there's something wrong with that. Now I'm going to blush. You know, one of the one of the problems with confessions by me. So here is 3C273. It's a quasar. David Hayworth observed it here in the U.S. and he observed the spectrum there. You can see perhaps two dots, which if we blow up are there emission lines, and there's the spectrum plotted. Martin Schmidt was 25 years old in the mid 1960s and he stared at this and was very frustrated. There is a transcript of an interview he did that I've read and tells this story and I can send you a link to that also if you request it. He looked at this and he could not figure out what those lines were. And he decided after some time that he would well, at least eliminate them being hydrogen bomber lines, you know, just to sweep away the things that it wasn't. By a process of elimination, we do science. So there is that image from my software I asked you to keep in your mind's eye. There are the bomber lines. And he looked at those lines in his own version of the software. <laughs> no, there was no software back then to speak of. And he said, they don't match. Okay, I'm done that. But then he noticed they do match with a shift. And it's a big shift. He was very excited. He thought about publishing this. And the interesting thing to read is him describing how afraid he was. He was afraid of being wrong. He was afraid he would publish this and other people in the field would laugh at him and say, this is a silly mistake you have made. It is not hydrogen bomber redshift. He asked his colleagues on the hallway to come and he discussed the ideas with him that he had with this shift and they agreed this was that. He was right. They all went back to his home. They all celebrated with a glass of wine. His wife says, he never did that. I knew something big was happening and he published. The discovery was not the redshift, the discovery was using the Hubble constant, he was able to calculate that this object was 2 billion light years away. And yet we could still see it, which meant it had to be enormously bright. These quasars, as they were named then, quasi-stellar objects, allowed him to determine that things were a lot further away and brighter than we'd ever seen before. Now, the amazing thing to me is that this light, which is 2 billion light years old, as if, in quotes, still has information that allows us to understand their source and how long and far away they are. It's amazing that that information has remained intact for that long. There are other things in the universe that do not age as well. Here is Martin Schmidt a few years ago. <laughs> now, I confess, I am throwing rocks and I live in a glass house. So anyway, let's move on. A couple more examples and we're done. Here so far, we've been studying the bomber features, the hydrogen bomber features and others in stars like Vega and other stars. How wide are these features? If we look at the width of this feature, it's about 50 angstroms wide. So that's, what a mess. That's our, that's our resolution. If we wanted to study this feature, we need higher resolution. That's when you buy a slit spectrometer that can produce a spectrum like this. This is the hydrogen alpha line. The fuchsia color here is Vega, and this is the moon. Now, the moon is not moving with reference to us very much. Clearly, Vega is. Look at that Doppler shift. But we needed resolution that was down under one angstrom instead of this 50 angstroms. So this is why people use slit spectrometers for this resolution. So I want to show you one last example. I wish I had a football for you. This is a rotating star. 
There's light here and there's light here. The star is rotating like this. So this light is going to be blue shifted because it's coming off of this edge that's rotating towards you. Whereas this light is going to be red shifted because it's coming off the edge that's receding. So we have blue shift and red shift on a rotating star. So instead of a very sharp dip like these dips, we see a smeared dip like this dip of Altair. Vega is not spinning very fast. Altair is. This is why we use a slit spectrometer. This is, can you believe it? We can, we can determine the spinning of a star. That French philosopher, August Comte, that we spoke of earlier, didn't think we'd be able to know even what stars are made of. And now we're studying uh, their speed, their rotational speed, their recession speed. I have a brief story, which again, is only to amuse you. And that is the closest I ever got to somebody with a, a Nobel prize is Adam Reese. Because when I published uh, my first article in Sky and Telescope and showed in 19 or in 20, 2011, uh, 20, 2009 or so, I showed this spectrum and I called this Doppler shift. The editor in chief of Sky and Telescope sent my article to Adam Reese. He had not yet won the Nobel Prize. And the editor said, Tom is calling this Doppler shift. Is that Doppler shift? He knew the answer. And Adam Reese replied in an email that I still have here hanging on the wall. No, it's not Doppler shift because nothing is moving. This is cosmological expansion. The subtlety of language is wonderful. So there really is no velocity here. There's expansion and we can talk about things in terms of speed and shift, but, but not movement, not Doppler shift. So last story, how do you get started? Very briefly, I mentioned the star analyzer, any sort of camera. It turns out that uh, this grading uh, needs to be uh, within a certain range of distances from the sensor. And so sometimes you need an adapter. You need software. If I was a good salesman, I would have mentioned my software's name repeatedly, RSpec for real-time spectroscopy. Here's some other, the, some of that freeware I mentioned earlier uh, that's really good. In fact, th those people are, are, what do I say here? Uh, they are, uh, uh, those, I'm really messing up this, this compliment. They're a lot smarter than me. Let, let me just put it that way. It's hard for me to say smarter, more knowledgeable, and their software, some of their software does amazing things that mine doesn't. But it's got a very steep learning curve. There's wonderful books out there. Uh, if uh, you were to buy one book, not cheap, about $80 US. This is a fun book because it has not, you don't even need to have a telescope to read this book and be fascinated by it. It's got these graphs uh, with uh, call outs, but even more importantly, it's got prose that explains what you're seeing. That's how we learn. My site has, and this is cool. You can do this even without a telescope. So listen up. I know some of you are, I know it's late. You've had dinner. I've gone on long further than I had planned. But you can go to my site today, tonight, tomorrow morning and download the software. It's free for 30 days, full version. At that same location, you can download some sample data and there's a link to a one hour in-person workshop I gave to the AAVSO meeting a few years ago. Work through the examples with us. Learn how to use the software, not so you buy it. I, that's the trouble with having a product to sell is everybody, everything I say gets tainted because people think I'm trying to sell. I'm trying to sell you on knowledge, you know? I'm trying to remember a Sanskrit quote, but I can't. Um, Shankaracharya quote, Tamasa something, uh, and I'm gonna forget it. I'm gonna forget it. I, now I'm really gonna blush because I can't pull it up. It just popped into mind. Knowledge removes darkness. And so you can learn how to do the things I showed you here, even without a telescope. So also the AVSO is big in this field now. They have a database, they have a, a section, a forum where you can discuss things. I'm speaking to them at their meeting this fall. 
You can do pro-am collaboration, but not a lot these days. So we have come a long way. Tamasa tamaso navartakam, I think is the quote. Forgive me for badgering and it, butchering it is, that. It is tamasoma jyotirgamaya. I hadn't heard the jyotir, but yeah, thank you, Sujata. I really <laughs> appreciate it. You've saved me. You pulled me out of the fire. I was roasting myself here. <laughs> Thank you for jumping in. So Fraunhofer uh, invented, discovered spectra by inventing a spectrometer. Kirchhoff was a contemporary of uh, Bunsen's and formulated some rules or laws that we use to explain things. And uh, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We, by virtue of the fact that you're here listening to this, we all have had great privilege in our lives to get the education that we've gotten and the excitement and knowledge that we have gained. We are standing on the shoulders of giants and I encourage you to share that knowledge as I know many of you do when the doors are open again and we can get outside, uh, sidewalk astronomy uh, in every other way. That's how we can give back. Thank you all for your patience, for laughing at my jokes, for forgiving me for all my transgressions and poor pronunciation. And uh, I now will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, we can get into some Q&A. Uh, and again, be, go easy on me here because I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions, I'm afraid. Go ahead. OK, thanks a lot, Tom, for your wonderful talk. It's really great to hear you. And I have a lot of questions, so let us start off. OK. The uh, first question is from Dr. Akole Balaji, and he is asking, while studying supernova through spectroscopy, can we study various dielectric parameters? I knew the first question already, I'm stumped. I don't know. I, I really, I'm really sorry. I just don't, I don't have any idea. Maybe Sujata knows. Uh, I'm... Sujata? I'm not an astronomer. I'm a zoologist. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as, by the way, am I badgering your name or butchering your name too? How do we pronounce it? I don't have the accents right, I'm sure. Uh, no, you are pronouncing it correctly. It's Sujata, right? Thank, no problem. Thank God. All right. Other questions? Okay. Uh, so we'll go to the next question. And uh, the next question is from Ashirwad, uh, who is a senior member of our own Khagol Mandal. And he is right now sitting in the uh, same country as you are in. Okay. Oh, so he has joined you from there. And yeah. he is asking for a star, let us say star A, which has binary or possibly some other unrelated star, which is yeah. close by say star right. B, are there issues in getting the spectra for star A without clutter or influence of the star B? Oh, that's a great uh, question. And what is the minimum intensity required to get sufficient light to capture that's various components? That's a really good question. Great questions. Thanks. Where are you here in the US, if I may ask? Uh, Ashirwad, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. There, oh, you muted yourself again. There you go. So I'm unmuted. Say again, please. Where are you located here in the US? I, I'm at Portland, Oregon. Oh, I'm just up in Seattle. We'll have to meet for coffee sometime when things open up. I, I Seriously, when things open, which could be a long time given how incompetent our government is, uh, but when things open up again, uh, let's, let's uh, make a point of getting together and having some coffee. I'd like that. Um, sure, so sure. when there's two stars, there's a couple problems. Of course, without a slit, when you're just using a grating, uh, the spectrum may be uh, separatable because if the stars are oriented so that the spectra are at different levels in the image, then you can just bracket and study that one. Uh, and I don't think there'll be any cross-contamination, but typically for those kinds of detailed studies, uh, the astronomer is going to use a slit and then they can isolate one star from the other. That's a great question. But your other question was, uh, what kind of intensity, what kind of brightness uh, do we uh, require? And that's a really good question uh, because it gets to the very issue of uh, what can we do as amateurs? So what I'm gonna do here is just share the screen again because I want to show you 
uh, you can see uh, the screen there, Sujata, uh, the software screen? Yes, yes, it's visible. Good, thank you. So, uh, and I'll stop this video from playing. Normally, when we normally image and just image a star, we have the photons, the total number of photons coming from that star on a handful of pixels on our camera. When we put a grating in the light path, now we've spread a lot of those pixels out across hundreds, excuse me, a lot of those photons across lots and lots of pixels. We lose five or six magnitudes of starlight. So if a telescope can normally image down to say magnitude 15, then with a grating in place, the imaging will be down to nine or 10. So there is a lot of light lost uh, or spread out. So uh, we need brighter stars. But even with a four inch refractor, if it's well corrected, not just a uh, off the shelf inexpensive, because we're dealing with colors here, the, uh, the, it needs to be an APO, you know, with this ED glass type of telescope rather than one that has a lot of chromatic aberration. I hope, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. You're yes. welcome. Let's talk yes. again sometime. Uh, hello, Who Bernard. else or what else? Hello, uh, I'll go to the next question. I request participants to keep their mics uh, muted because we get a lot of disturbance otherwise. Uh, the next question is asked by Archana and uh, there are other couple of questions which are in the same category. So I'll take them together. Archana is asking which is the best source to study for the basics? That's a very good question. And it's a very, I, you know, I would encourage you to go to our site. Um, it's, it's really difficult to answer because I don't know what level of understanding you have. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was on, on our site. In fact, I can just go there, try and go there. Um, let's see what happens, whether I really mess up the meeting when I go somewhere here. Um, on our uh, links page, down here are books. These aren't the best books, perhaps, if you don't have a telescope. This is that atlas I showed you. But uh, there's other books that are more pragmatic. Uh, I love, this title always bothered me, Astrophysics is Easy. I don't think that's really a true statement. <laughs> but I don't have any suggestions. I'm sorry. Um, you might email me from the contact form on the site, and we can discuss it a little bit in terms of uh, knowledge. I would say the web is a good source of knowledge. Um, and I like these books. I just hesitate to recommend one more than the other. Uh, I'll tell you one really fun one. Uh, and that is, let's see where it is. It's, uh, I mean, these, these by Keith Robinson are good. This one, the Introduction to Stellar Physics for Amateurs. So those are good. If uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a more definitive answer, but I haven't really taught in a formal setting. Um, Maybe with some friends, you go in and buy this book uh, and uh, or find this in a library. It's a relatively recent book because um, this and, and its companion book uh, are, are also really interesting and informative. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you. I'm disappointed in myself. What else? Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, now I'll shift over to Abhay because he is watching the YouTube streaming and he has questions from there. So over sure. to Abhay. Yeah. Um, there are multiple questions from the YouTube uh, group, and a strong group of almost like 60 70 people. Uh, Utkarsh Sharma and Rugvet Kulkarni, they want to ask you how do we measure temperature of stars or supernova using spectrum? Great question. Really, how do we measure the temperature of stars? And for that, I'm going to start the show again. And uh, forget, oh no, I actually wanted to uh, show you in my software. Um, so let me turn some things off here. This is really exciting. That is a great question. So there is the spectrum we got off of Vega. Now Vega is a type A star. So what I'm going to do in the software 
is I have a library of professional spectra that are calibrated for the instrument and they're accurate. And I'm gonna say, show me what a, a type A zero star spectrum would look like. So in blue is, the, is a professional spectrum and in red, the red one there is mine. Boy, they really are different, aren't they? Well, the exciting thing is there are similarities, right? Our type A dip is, is it's shallow and wide and theirs is narrow and deep. Well, they're using million dollar instruments. There's our hydrogen uh, beta. Just to show they do match in some ways, the spectroscopic features are there, but notice that their curve keeps going up and ours doesn't. And the reason for that is because our camera loses sensitivity in the blue because of the sensor and the, 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 the CCD camera just doesn't capture photons that are blue as well. So we have some distortion in our curve. If our curve matched that exactly, we would know that this was a type A star and then we would know its temperature. And how would we do that? Just very briefly, this is so, so cool. So this library over here has all the stars in temperature order, O, B, A, uh, F, G, and then KM. And what I'm going to do here is go through those very quickly and watch how on these type A stars, all the energy is down mm -hmm. here outside the visual range. But watch as I go through those stars, I'm gonna do this with the button designed just for the question you asked. Watch how that peak on the right migrates to the right. Now we're in the A stars, cooler, F stars, G stars, K stars, M stars. All the energy in these M stars is over in the infrared range. So we can, these are as if Planck curves. There are curves, the stars are not exactly black body um, objects. We can't exactly use Wine's law to, for those of you who are familiar with those, but by, by comparing our curve to a professional curve, and there is a way to correct our curve for this lack of sensitivity here, we can tell the temperature. However, that's not how professionals do it. Professionals, Let's clear that. Professionals, and this is a file in our software, use the existence of different element spectra to determine, to determine the star temperature. So if there's a lot of hydrogen, we know it's probably a type A star. If there's a lot of molecules like that cool type M star, or those bands I showed you, we know that it's a cool type M star. So they study the spectra lines, the absorption lines. This isn't, these aren't spectra here. This is just showing the relative strength of the absorption lines, how many there are. So really hot stars have a lot of ionized helium. So if you look at a star and you find a lot of lines for ionized helium, wherever they are. So that's how professionals detect temperature and amateurs uh, will use the shape of the curve to approximately identify the star type. So great question. It gets to the very heart of astrophysics. So thank you for asking that. That's it. Uh, yeah, there are more questions. Uh, two from Prakash Kamaji, and he is having uh, a doubt about in, what you talk about is spectrum and lines in visible spectrum. What about frequencies beyond the visual spectrum? That's one yeah. question. Yeah. And the other one is the lights get reflected from surface of moon. So is it the same as solar spectrum? or little different, the two questions from Prakashji. I, I knew, I said in the beginning, I predicted it, I would get great questions from an Indian audience. So, um, and again, um, the first question, what about lines outside the visible range? Of course, this is approximately our visible range. And in fact, there, there could be some lines out here, but my camera, ooh, that's a little more than I wanted to zoom. Uh, we, we are unable to detect those lines with my camera. If there are lines out there, for example, look at these lines out here in this type M star that we've looked at. There can be lines out there. We just need a camera that can capture that light. And for that, we need specialized sensors. And oftentimes we have to get above the atmosphere because the atmosphere introduces uh, lines like this water line here. One way we do that, of course, is uh, with the Hubble and other um, uh, observatories that are in orbit. Also, we will 
use a spectrograph that's on an airplane. The Boeing 747 named Sophia has a complete uh, telescope on it uh, that um, I'm just going to try and get there and show it to you. And it goes and So this is the spectrometer telescope. There's our poster, by the way. We're very proud that our poster is flying on that plane. So they fly up to, there it is. You can see it's a wonderful image if you're not familiar with it. There's the side of the whole plane opens and there's the telescope in there. And, and my, my poster somewhere back in there. So um, that's how we can observe spectra that are outside the visible range is get above the atmosphere and use specialized instruments that can see outside the visual the visual range like um well like uh, the, the remote control on your tv set uses infrared light that we can't see but there's a sensor on the tv that can see it so that's an answer to that question i'm and i'm really embarrassed honestly that i can't remember the set what was the second question yeah the second question was about the spectrum of moon is it the oh same yeah as yeah yeah great question too uh, and for that, I'm going to go back. Uh, that shows a lot of insight uh, into thinking about this. And I wanted to show you a slide we saw before. I hope I'm not giving you, uh, making you nauseated by all this scrolling. If I was a little more professional, I would, uh, first of all, stop speaking and focus on what I'm trying to find. Uh, but secondly, I would uh, also um, have my slides numbered and know where, what I was looking for. So let's go, let, let's do this. I'm just going to search for Neptune and see whether I can find that slide. That's not even there. So I have slides of uh, Neptune and Uranus. Uh, so let's, let's go a little more slowly here. Uh, so we have uh, uh, OB of fine GKM, and then we have DSLR, and there we go. So let's look at that slide. So here is Uranus. Like the moon, it's all reflected light. It's not uh, emitting any light of its own. And you are absolutely correct. If we were to look at the spectrum of Uranus, just plain, we would see mostly the sun spectrum. However, if there's any atmosphere around the planet, or if the surface is, is affecting the light when it reflects it, it will <clears throat> add additional features to the spectrum. <clears throat> and so I didn't get into it here earlier, but this plot is actually the spectrum of Uranus divided by a, the spectrum of a star like the sun to remove the sun's features in that spectrum. So now all this is, is the features that were contributed by the planet itself, because we as, as if subtracted out the sun spectrum. I hope that helps answer your question, which, as I said, is a really good one. Thank you for asking. What else? Yeah, uh, I have a related question from Chinmay, uh, and who is asking, can we analyze exoplanets using spectroscopy with the software? <laughs> yeah, but the, we can. The software it can do that, but the challenge is having uh, the data. If you can download calibrated data from, uh, from NASA or from other sites, um, then we could analyze it in the software, definitely. We can anal analyze exoplanet. Uh, there's two different ways we use spectral on exoplanets. One is if, uh, let's have a little visual aid here. Here's our star again, and here's a planet. Uh, um, Tom? Oh, oh, you can't we see We cannot see sharing. you. Yeah, you have to Thank stop sharing. Thank you very much. So here's a star and here's a planet. And the planet is going around the star. And so when the planet is between you and the star, it actually pulls the star a little bit towards you. And when the planet is behind it, it pulls the star away from you a tiny bit. The planet's much lighter than the star, but it still pulls the star back and forth. So the star is going like this, very small amount. But that will cause the spectrum to go blue shift, red shift, blue shift, red shift. And by studying that change, we can infer that there is something tugging on that planet 
on that star to make that happen. And that's how we detect, that's how the first exoplanet was detected. These days we do it photometrically by looking at a dip in the light as the planet blocks a small piece of the star. The second way we use spectroscopy on exoplanets is to study, to study their atmosphere. And uh, at the moment that the planet goes behind the star, there's a moment there just like a total solar eclipse where we can see just the atmosphere. And then we can study that, uh, the, the composition of that atmosphere. To be honest, I don't know how much of that we do now. I think we do do some, but I don't know how much. That's something you can read on and report back to me on our contact form on our site. What other questions do you have? Sure. Uh, Karthik is asking, due to the scattering effect of Earth's atmosphere, light from star may get polluted with unwanted light within Earth's atmosphere. So. Right. Uh, what are the methods to make sure that the spectrum is pure and not polluted? Good question. We, take in, we, we are fortunate to have spectra captured by Hubble. Those aren't polluted. So we have an unpolluted spectrum from Hubble here, and we have our, our camera here. And by taking a, a, a spectrum of the same star that Hubble took, we know any differences between the Hubble spectrum and our spectrum are because of the atmosphere or because of the grading or because our telescope uh, camera isn't linear. So it's a very insightful question. We have to remove all those sources of contamination. And we do that by comparing it to a spectrum that was captured without contamination. Thanks for that question, I appreciate it. Great. Uh, now I'll hand over to Abhay. He yeah, has I got questions. many questions. So Abhishek Jovekar, he's a very wonderful astro photographer, and his uh, photographs have appeared in various, including APOD. So he wants to ask, can he use a 15,000 LPI square shape tracking instead of the star analyzer and get a higher resolution spectrum? Will it work with the RSpec software? Great question again. Thank you, and I look forward to seeing some of your uh, some of your photographs. I hope you'll use our contact form on the site. And I'm not trying to harvest people's emails to be marketing. I think we all are rightfully suspicious these days. Uh, but um, the problem with uh, doing what you suggest is that um, let me share the screen again. Am I sharing my screen now? No, not yet. Uh, not yet. Uh, there not we yet. go. So How it's coming. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I want to show you here is, let me think where it is. It is here. I'm going to show you, this is on our site, uh, and I, I don't want to play this whole video, but I want to show you, hold on just a moment. Let's launch this up. I don't think you can hear the audio, thank goodness. But what you can see is, Oh, thanks, YouTube. Here's an example of a telescope with a grating and the star, and there's the spectrum. But if we have too many lines per millimeter in the grating, what happens is the spectrum gets spread out. So you can see it's longer here and it's further away from the star. And with 15,000 lines per millimeter, it's so spread out, it won't even fit on your camera sensor. So uh, you can try, try holding it up in front of the, the uh, lens of your camera. That's called an objective grading. Put it here and then play with your uh, zoom, your focal length of your lens, and you should see for yourself whether it's possible. Uh, I think you'll find that you need fewer lines per millimeter, uh, a less uh, high resolution grading. It's a good question. I hope you'll experiment though, and uh, let us know how the results turn out. Yeah. What else do we have, Sujata? Yeah, yeah, we have got many questions, but we are just collating so that, you know, there's no repetition. Uh, Good. Well, while you're collating, I just want to, again, reiterate, these are the best and the most questions I've ever gotten. And as you've heard earlier this evening, uh, I have such enormous respect for India, and it's because of this love of knowledge. Uh, and um, uh, while you're collating, I might mention, so I lived in Quambator for some time, and I lived in Cochin for some time. And I've traveled around. I spoke at the Nehru Planetarium in New Delhi some years ago. Uh, is it in Delhi or is it in Mumbai? Both. Which is it, Sujata? Yeah, I can't both, both, both places have. Both? 
Yes. Arvind uh, Arvind was the uh, director of the planetarium. That is Bombay. Bombay. Then that is Mumbai. Yeah, that that is was Mumbai. Bombay. Yeah. Yeah. I loved I I loved meeting my friends there. It was really wonderful. Anyway, any questions? Call yeah, in. The now? question is is from Anurag Shewde. He is from Kabul Mandal. He's our astrophotographer. In fact, he introduced your name to me. So he put me on to this talk. So I'm very thankful to Anurag. Yes. Uh, he is asking that in case of spectral resolution of a spectrograph being constant, how do we maximize the spectral purity? Can you ask that again in case of what? The spectral resolution of a spectrograph grating being constant, how do we maximize the purity of the spectrum? I don't really understand the uh, how how we would maximize the purity of the spectrum. So maybe you can- uh, I'll send the mail. I'll ask him to send the mail to you. Oh yeah, question. that's fine. Yeah, or you can explain it in a little more detail to you and you to me. Yeah, um, yeah. I see here, I because I just came back to the screen, I can see, I would, uh, I can see all everybody's uh, thumbnails. Oh no, he went away. What was that young guy? Subam, was it? Shubham? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is Shubham. he one, one of the youngest attendees of the meeting? Does he come regularly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm, I'm so. I'm, he also so, has a question I'll ask you. Oh, um, I'm so happy. I'm so happy you're here and asking questions. Congratulations. What's your question? Yeah. Uh, Shubham's question is how to differentiate between the shift due to red or blue shift and the expansion of universe? I don't know if there's a way. I'd never thought of that before. I love these questions. Um, oh, I think, actually, I don't know. Any? Do you have any, any anybody who has an answer to that, please? <laughs> Raise your hand or type a message. Uh, I don't think there's any way there. There's no way to differentiate shift to shift. Now you can compare, uh, I was gonna say you can compare adjacent stars, but that doesn't work. But in-, in uh, Spectrum of a galaxy. Pardon me? Uh, yeah. Taking the spectrum of a uh, shifted variable from some galaxy. Yes, you. Um, it's true. All the stars in a galaxy would have the same shift, yeah. or nearly the same shift, because of cosmological expansion. Uh, thanks for the the suggestion. That's a good one. So if we're looking at M one hundred one and it's got a certain radial velocity, all the spectra are going to be shifted that much, plus a little bit for whatever local motions the stars have. Uh, so that would be one way to tease the two out from one another is on a galactic level, but on a uh, within our uh, our own galaxy, there's no way that I know of. But I'm ignorant of many things, and this may well be one. So very good question from Ved Vrat, and is is very practical question. How is it possible to capture exact spectrum of only desired object? Because there could be many obstacles including the gravitational lensing and dark matter and what all. That's true. Um, and that's really more for a research scientist to answer. Mm -hmm. How can we capture, uh, can you read that one more time? Not that it's gonna help me answer, but it'll give me some time to think. Go ahead, please. Well, he's asking, how do we capture the exact spectrum of the only desired object? How do you know yeah. you're capturing that, that object only? Yeah. And not I, th else. I think that's a, a challenge with any scientific measurement, and that is how to remove uh, extraneous uh, data that is uh, noise, basically. And um, I, I think that that's really, again, a matter of comparing, as in the previous question, comparing this, the spectrum of the star you're looking at to other spectra. With gravitational lensing, it becomes a real challenge, I'm sure. I don't know much more about that answer. I wish I did. Uh, and that's something I'm going to read about. Yeah, um, but I think Vedvarat, it is uh, first challenge is to find which star you are looking with the telescope yes. that you are you are seeing. I oh. guess you should do a lot for observation, then you'll be sure what you are looking at. Yeah, so Jata will answer I, this question. And I thought actually, I thought the question was going to be a little different. Uh, and I just to show you because it's it's a good question in itself. Um, let's click the share button here, and that is uh, in my show. Again, forgive me as I look for the slide that I'm looking for here. One moment. If I got more question and answer sessions like this, I would definitely know my slide numbers better. <laughs> but here is a wide field. And I thought your question was going to be, what if there is a star in the background behind yes. like, like that? Correct. So there's yes. a star back there, which would create a big jump in our graph. 
Correct. And uh, there's another example. That star is not part of this spectrum. So, and the answer to that is it can be very challenging. First of all, if you have a slit, then your slit is, is going to be uh, at just, or the only light you'll be capturing is from the star. You won't have all this sky background in your field. Um, and so you don't have a problem when you're using a slit. But when you're using a slitless grating, sometimes you just have to subtract, you just have to remove those pixels from your image. Or, and this is really amazing. So are you saying, Sujata, that you can't see me right now? Uh, no, we can't see you. Oh, that's we really too bad because I was doing a lot of fun things when I was sharing my screen. I assumed I could be seen. But this grating here, uh, again, um, we cannot see you. You will have to stop sharing the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I cleared that screen. I thought that was, yeah. yeah. This grating here, you can rotate it a tiny bit on your telescope. And when you do that, instead of the spectrum coming out like this, it will rotate, it will just be like this. The stars will stay where they are. And you can often just rotate the grating so that the spectrum falls between any stars that you're looking at. What other questions okay. do we have? Okay, uh, so we have uh, one more question from Anurag and he's asking uh, what factors uh, decide the vertical height of the uh, spectrum? Is it same as the FWHM of a star? Yeah. Um, yes, um, and that is, I mean, what, what he's asking is, let's clear that blue line and clear that. I think he's asking, uh, first of all, about the full width half maximum of these, as well as why is this this height? What, yeah, in other words, what's, what's, this, yeah. what's this y axis unit of measure? Hmm. And this is not calibrated units. Remember when a photon hits the, uh, the uh, cell of your CCD, a certain amount of that energy is converted into bits. Uh, analog units from the star, it's an analog uh, light, and then it hits the, the camera sensor, and we get some count. And what that, num what that count is depends on the sensitivity of the camera. What, what's the full well depth of the camera? Most uh, astronomical cameras, the full well depth is 64,000 units, arbitrary units. So these are not calibrated. So that if the star is brighter, these will be brighter. These will all be bright, be higher. But in order to calibrate and actually get these in electron volts or whatever the unit of energy is for the photons, we have to do a lot of work to know the uh, efficiency of our camera, the efficiency of our telescope, the efficiency of our grading, lots of things. So um, unfortunately, uh, uh, they aren't calibrated units. But for most of us, all we're really doing is looking for absorption features. Uh, again, more advanced amateurs will actually look at the full width half maximum. And just to show you what that looks like, um, and I like this because it's a feature that, that helps explain it. If we bracket in that, that absorption line down and then ask the software, there's our full width half maximum, right? There's the full width and it's halfway between the top and bottom. The challenge here is where is the top and bottom? You know, where should I position these lines so that we're getting just this feature and none of the continuum on either side? So we do measure the, the depth and strength of these features by the full width half maximum, this distance, which is the distance between lines halfway between the top and the bottom. And there is no easy way to know where the top and bottom are. Bottom is easy. Top, it's a little harder. So I wandered around on my answer there. I hope that was helpful, though. Now, Anurag has got many questions, but what I'll do is I'll just send the mail to you because there's almost nine questions. They're okay. really, very really technical, good questions. I would uh, request you to reply them and I'll forward this uh, uh, email to Anurag. Great, I will do that. We would like to start the spectroscopy under your uh, you know, guidance uh, in our club. So these questions will be very uh, good for us. Great. So Jata has got two more questions for you. Great. And then I have a question for the group. Go ahead. Yeah. OK. OK. okay. Uh, uh, one question is from Bharat. Uh, and I think it's a very basic question. Uh, but uh, we'll take it up. He is saying how to identify a star or a distant galaxy. Right. Well, we again, fortunately, they've made very, very detailed star maps. 
So if we know where we're looking in the sky, you know, what our elevation and what our azimuth is, uh, the sky has a coordinate system that they have superimposed on it. And we can compare what we're seeing to the star charts, many of which you can now find on your phone for free. There are applications you may know. And they're exciting because you just look up in the sky and it will show you what you're seeing. So that's how we, that's how we identify them uh, over time. Now, you had another question there, Sujata? Yeah. Uh, and the last question from my side is, uh, Bhaskar is asking, where can we get the poster you told about? I think he's talking about your periodic table poster. Oh, all right. Uh, so um, you can get the periodic poster table from our site. It's probably easiest to go there from here, I hope. I hope it takes us there. Oh, I need to, am I sharing my screen now? No, not yet. Not yet. You know, you'd think, because I've given this talk a lot, you'd think that I would have understood how to share screens, but I have notes taped on other screens that are often covering things up that I need to see. But let's share my screen so that you can see. We'll go to the site here. And the poster um, on our site, uh, just scroll down to this picture of Neil deGrasse Tyson and me. That's the story I told. We're out on the street outside the theater. And if you click on it, it will take you to a place where you can purchase. The international poster price is there. It's not laminated because uh, we, uh, it's very expensive to ship from the US. So we, these are printed in the UK without lamination. And there's a zoom in on the poster that you can see. So you can just do that on our site. You'll be able to find it there. And if you have trouble, just use our contact form and you can contact me on the site. That's, so now I get, to ask, I get to ask a question here. Sure, that go is, ahead. For those of you who aren't in your pajamas, and I know this word pajama is a Hindi word. It's one of the many things we owe to India is the word pajamas. So turn your cameras on. I want to see who I've been speaking with. It's not fair. You've gotten to see me. If, if it's okay, you know, if you're young, you may need to check with your parents. Oh, there we go. Nirban Amog, pardon my pronunciation. Ashirwad uh, Abai, I saw early. Nita, hello, Nita. I'm happy to meet you. Uh, okay. Sue Abai Smith. is sitting here. Oh, there he is, finally. Uh, Dr. Prakash, thank you very much. This is wonderful. I'm so happy to see you all and to see how young you are. That's really great. Kartik, uh, let's see, who else? Oh, Chinmay, I know you. I knew a Swami Chinmayananda <laughs> some time ago. Avinash, Dr. Tanji, nice to meet you. Uh, Shubham, uh, let's see who else is coming up. I don't know if I miss, Avinash, you asked some good questions. There's so many young people here. Dr. Prakash, we should be very happy for India's youth who are pursuing this knowledge. Don't you think? Oh, Ra Ram Shetty, thank you for coming on. Many doctors here, which is great. Yeah, uh, we had a really some... wide spectrum of people from yeah. ninth grade up to those who are done PhD. Many engineers, many undergraduates, many master students, and of course, many are on YouTube because of the response in Zoom because uh, only those who came early were on Zoom. Rest everybody is on YouTube. And the questions that I'm asking are coming from the YouTube. Uh, Great. And what Sujata is asking is coming from the Zoom for us. So in Great. all, you have about uh, 120 people attending your wow. talk right now. So That's fantastic. And I see Shubham. Yeah. I love your photograph, Shubham, with the, with the spectrum. Uh, across it. That's really wonderful. Uh, welcome, Mukund and uh, Shaila Prakash. You know, I have not tried to pronounce your or Dr. Prakash's last name because I'm afraid I will fail. Hajare, I'm going to guess. How's yes, that? correct, correct, got correct. It. Right, you got cool. it right. <laughs> Who else? Uh, anybody else want to turn their camera on? I, I so appreciate this opportunity. And also, if I just get people to smile, you know, there's Shaila and Dr. Prakash are smiling. What, what more does the human heart want to see but a smile? Well, that's, that's wonderful. Are there any last questions? I, I'm so sorry that this is going to end because uh, as I said, and I, I, I know I've said it repeatedly, I think, uh, I haven't said this. I honestly believe, although India has many challenges like many countries have, I certainly know. India also uh, being the largest democracy on the planet, 
especially since the US uh, is a failed democracy at this time. And I say that with, with almost literally tears in my eyes. India offers great hope for the planet. I mean that, I'm not just saying that. And uh, uh, the hope for, in, for the world from India is, the, uh, is all of you. And this uh, tradition of knowledge, jnanam, hard work, uh, cultural values, heritage that comes from um, so long ago, as well as modern. India's accomplishments are stunning. And I, I cheer every time I read about India's success in, in all fields. Uh, I honestly believe that India has a, a something special about it, culturally. That uh, again, uh, this parampara of knowledge and, and culture has uh, really given your country, as evidenced by the youth here in this view. I don't say this to every country I speak to, my friends, uh, but uh, again, uh, I'm I'm biased. <laughs> I I love I love your country. So uh, congratulations to you all. And if there is ever anything that I can do for you, I will try to do it. Don't hesitate. You know, Smriti, I don't think I said hello to you when you put your video on. So I'm happy to meet you too. And to see your ceiling fan at the same time. That's wonderful. <laughs> so for those of you who didn't see my live video, cause I thought my live video feed, this is what I put on earlier. I wanted to show you the hydrogen bomber lines that were here and the beta and the alpha. You know, I'm, this is the dress for success. I mentioned that my family always taught me. These are important things, right? So, and the other thing I showed that you didn't see was my averted vision joke. Okay, this yeah, I'm looking that's, right that's at. Good. Yeah. Yeah, and then now, now I'm looking away. So, it's always okay to be a clown. Uh, at least I hope so. My parents sometimes thought not when I came home from school and uh, got fired by a teacher. But <laughs> in in general, it's okay to work hard and then to play. Thank you all so much for your time. And if there's anything I can do, as I said, please reach out to me. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Tom, for your kind words about us, about the country. And yeah. Abhay has an announcement to make uh, before we end the program. Yeah, over to Abhay. Thanks a lot, Tom, for the excellent talk. And I'm really, Hello. very my happy wife. to have you on our forum. Hello. And I'm thankful to all the participants. We are doing these many, many, many talks these days. Hello. Earlier, Dr. Henry Throop talks uh, from right. the, uh, about the New Horizon a month back. Now you are here. We are very thankful for you to come and explain this beautiful new field Hello. for us. Hello. Well, back in 95, I did spectroscopy, especially for the solar eclipse, and we carried a huge uh, spectroheliograph of my university all the way to Uttar Pradesh, north of India, and put on for the flash spectrum. That was my starting point for the wow. astro. Uh, spectrography. And uh, it's great to hear about those things after 25 years. I had never done spectrum later on. Now I restart doing the spectroscopy thanks to Wonderful. your excellent talk. Great. I used to thank all the participants who came and waited despite of the conditions which are like extreme rain in Bombay, Maharashtra region, not good connectivity. And they asked phenomenally good questions. I'm sure they'll be joining us again and again. From all of us in India, Tom, Thanks a lot. We are really grateful to you and uh, have a safe time over there and hope to see you very soon again. Thank you. You're welcome. And again, thanks to Samir, who behind the scenes made all the things work that needed to work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Good evening so and uh, have, a, have a great sleep tonight. Goodbye. Good. Yeah. Good. And good day to you, Tom.